Hi, I'm Dr. Sarah Kate. I'm a breast surgeon at Mount Sinai. I'm an assistant professor of surgery. I'm an assistant program director of our breast fellowship, and I run a high risk program here. I've been here for seven years as an attending, and I also did my fellowship here. Um, so what it means to be a breast surgeon is that we take care of all types of patients with breast problems from cancer to cysts to high risk. Um, so I will see any patient that has a cancer and help you through that process. Um, and then I also follow patients that need prophylactic surgery and patients that maybe need to be followed a little bit more closely um, than our primary care doctors um, have time for. Um, so that means creating an individualized screening plan for every patient and deciding who needs genetic testing. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jordan Jacobs. I'm one of the plastic and reconstructive surgeons here at Mount Sinai. Uh, I'm the director of plastic surgery at the downtown campus. Uh, I've been on faculty at Mount Sinai for seven years now as well. And along with Dr. Kate, we uh, have the privilege of taking care of uh, breast cancer patients here at Mount Sinai. Um, we offer a full range of reconstructive uh, options for our patients, and we're really excited uh, to celebrate those patients as part of Breast Reconstruction Awareness Day uh, 2020. Um, and we're going to be meeting with a couple of our patients who have um, been through uh, the process, and they're going to share their journey uh, with you today. I am Dr. Andrew Salzberg. I am a plastic surgeon at Mount Sinai. I'm actually the chief of the plastic surgery division for all the hospitals at Mount Sinai. And I've been back at Mount Sinai for about six or seven years now. Before that, I was in private practice up in Westchester County. Uh, and now it's my 35th year of doing plastic surgery. So uh, we run the breast program and breast reconstruction program here at Mount Sinai in all the campuses. Uh, and you've met uh, two of our great surgeons, uh, both breast and plastic surgery, and we coordinate all of the surgeries together uh, to give the patients both the reconstructive options of using implants uh, for reconstruction or their own tissues, autologous reconstruction. And we do uh, many of both uh, in the world of Mount Sinai. Thanks for joining us. We're so happy you're here. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Of course, okay. this is um, this is in celebration of Breast Reconstruction Awareness Day, which happens every October. This year, it's October twenty first, and although we can't have a, a live in person event, uh, we have the benefit of uh, amazing patients such as yourself joining us, um, and really um, giving other patients information about their experience, um, so other women can can benefit. Um, you know, from your journey. Uh, so we have some, some very easy questions. Dr. Kate's going to get them started off just about uh, your specific uh, experience um, with your reconstruction. Okay. So tell us why you chose a deep flap for reconstruction. The, the deep flap for me was a really obvious choice, both medically and cosmetically. I, I understood that, um, but medically, the chance of infection, the chance of complication was lower if I was using my own tissue. Um, there was no implant that might eventually have to be replaced. And cosmetically, I expected it to look and feel pretty natural, the results, and, and that's, that's, that's what happened. That's what I got. Um, and then personally for me, I had a... Um, a significant enough diastasis recti abdominal separation from having been pregnant that it bothered me. It made, um, you know, getting dressed complicated. And uh, that was something that Dr. Jacobs closed up while he was in there doing the, the other abdominal surgeries. So that was another benefit for me of choosing the, the deep flap. I, th I think, uh, you bring up a couple of great points for women to consider. Uh, the first is um, absolutely there's lower infection rate using your own your own uh, fat because there's nothing foreign. Uh, I think the other thing is it's um, it's always uh, 
I think, easier to obtain better symmetry uh, between the reconstructed breast and, uh, and the native breast using your own fat. As, as we said in the office, you know, your own fat uh, behaves as close to a real breast um, as possible and it ages uh, like, like a real breast. So we like that uh, for symmetry. And then I think the other point about uh, changes in the abdominal contouring, um, you know, if a woman uh, has to go through this process, we, we, we certainly like to think that, um, you know, any improvement in, in the contour of the abdomen or other donor site um, is maybe a, a, an added benefit uh, to this whole process. Um, so can you tell us what you feel like your actual recovery was like and how long it took you to go back to work? Sure. So I took six weeks off of work and that ended up being um, just about perfect for me. I felt more than ready to go back when I did. I had asked what the most conservative estimate um, was and I think I think you had told me four or five weeks and and so I really was feeling ready by the time I went back. I um, I had been in the hospital for a couple of nights and I went home with, um, with drains and with a compression wrap to recover at home. Um, I was in very little pain. Dr. Jacobs had used, I believe it was a nerve blocker that uh, continued to work for a number of days after the surgery. And I ended up not taking any prescription painkillers or any over-the-counter painkillers. So pain really was not an issue for me with the surgery. Um, I was very careful to protect my abdomen because I had had the, the abdominal surgery. So I walked around, um, you know, stooped over for about 10 days while the, the skin on my stomach stretched out enough so that I could straighten up. And um, at first I slept on, on this couch, it's lower than my bed and it was easier to get up and down and it was easier to kind of stay in that protected position while I was sleeping. I used a bunch of pillows and cushions to kind of support myself so that I wasn't stretching my abdomen. Um, and at first everything was, was pretty gnarly. I came home with three drains and uh, stitches and tape on top of the stitches and there was swelling and I had a, um, a circle of skin where my right nipple had been. I, because of the position of the cancer, I wasn't able to have the nipple sparing um, surgery. I had, I had lost the nipple and, um, and it all had taken a long time to, to settle. Um, I had the first surgery in January and then I did some occupational therapy a couple of weeks after that, and that helped me restore the range of motion and got me ready to start radiation about a month after my my first surgery, which was the mastectomy and the and the deep flap reconstruction. Um, and at that point, that was a month out, and I was able to get my arm into position and hold it there for the radiation. And I felt normal enough to be taking the subway every day for those, those weekday appointments. So I was feeling pretty normal at that point. Um, and then it was in November that I had the, the second surgery, which created the nipple and evened out my breasts. Um, and there was some swelling after that. I wore compression garments for a number of months and I would say, also I had gained weight for both of my surgeries because I wanted to give Dr. Jacobs enough fat to work with. And, um, and I think it was probably nine months or so after the second surgery that I really felt like I had settled into my normal, my new normal, my, my post-cancer body. I had lost the extra weight that I had gained. The, the scars were less prominent. Um, and I felt like I had you know, my normal post-cancer body at that point. Great, I mean, that's uh, just so, uh, so well said, um, every aspect of it. Uh, I think the, the nerve blocks you brought up are uh, an important thing for women to know. We, we perform that 
in, in every surgery. Uh, sometimes uh, they work perfectly and women have no pain. I think yours worked really well. <laughs> um, and so we're really quite pleased when I, you know, we see you the next morning and you're, you're sitting up in bed and just want a little Tylenol for a headache. We're, we're so pleased uh, when they do work. Um, one other thing I think specifically for you, because lots of women um, you know, don't have enough fat in their belly um, to you know, reconstruct uh, their current breast size. So I think for you, we used both sides of the belly. So we did two flaps, uh, that is two deep flaps up to one breast, um, something called a stacked deep flap. Um, and I think, I think we got you pretty close volume wise. And then certainly with the secondary touch up surgery, um, you know, it gave us the ability to, uh, to balance you out a little bit better. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's really, really wonderful, uh, you know, to see you um, after you've gone through uh, quite a journey. Thank you. <laughs> um, can you tell us about what being a mom with breast cancer and getting the various treatments was like, um, if you feel comfortable sharing a little bit. For sure, of course. Yeah, that was one of the more interesting parts of the whole experience for me. I think being, being a mom while going through treatment really um, grounded and focused me a lot. I feel like it gave me a lot of strength and joy. My husband and I had a really clear idea of what we wanted our son's life to look like while I was getting treatment and we wanted it to be as happy and normal as possible. Um, my son Max was four when I was diagnosed, so he was very young and he's six now and he weathered the experience incredibly well. Um, my husband Paul was coming to the end of a, a contract job when I was first diagnosed and we made a family decision that he wasn't going to look for a, another gig, that he was going to focus on taking care of me and keeping things as normal as possible at home for our son and we were lucky that he was able to make that decision that we were able to to make that decision and it made an incredible difference just to have all of that time and and support um we followed some great advice we talked to some social workers and some family therapists and some of the best advice that we had gotten was to tell max everything in language that he could understand and we did that and and we just kind of went on from there and folded cancer into the experience of, of our family. And so, um, you know, when it came time for my hair started to fall out, I got chemo before I got the surgery. And when my hair started to fall out, we went and got family haircuts from the barber who had been cutting my husband's hair for probably 20 years at this point and had started cutting my son's hair when he started getting haircuts. and. And we went into the West Village and the guys got what they always get and I got a buzz cut and we went out to brunch afterwards. We just, we just kept going and we had a lot of support, which was really critical for us. We had three fantastic babysitters and pre-cancer, maybe we would have had a babysitter once every couple of months and, and we lined up regular, regular help. We had somebody come one night a week and for a few hours on the weekend and it was great to know we needed the break. I was exhausted from treatment and my husband was exhausted from doing the work of two parents. And um, it was great to know that when Max wasn't with us, he was with, with loving caretakers who were really sensitive to what he was going through. We were lucky that he was in a very um, warm, cozy pre-K with an amazing teacher and we were open with her about what was going on and she was able to give him a good deal of support. He did a lot of, of storybook writing that year um, where he was illustrating stories and dictating them to his teacher because he wasn't writing at that point. And some of them were about fighting ninjas and some of them were about cancer. And it was great that he had that kind of environment and that kind of support system um, with his, in his classroom that year. And, um, you know, when I look back, I looked at some family photos from that time just to sort of refresh my, my memory. And I'm struck by how normal and happy we look when what we were going through was so extraordinary and difficult. But I think something about how we handled it as a family and something about the natural resilience of a four-year-old really, really pulled us through well. 
that's really it's so amazing to hear um you know in your own words about something that you went through that was so incredibly difficult um and it just reminds us that our patients are so resilient and that we learn so much from our patients um about strength and about parenting and how to be better people so thank you very much for sharing that um and the other question that i wanted to ask was about your feeling of self-image and how you felt you know at different times during this journey how you felt after the surgery and then how you feel now as compared to then that's it's an interesting question it's definitely something that's evolved and that continues to evolve. I actually had considered not getting reconstruction and I think I would have considered it even more seriously if I had needed a, a double mastectomy. It turned out that I was negative for the BRCA gene and so I, I didn't. Um, or if I hadn't been a candidate for the deep flap reconstruction, that was a real possibility for, for me to, to choose not to, to reconstruct. And um, I felt like, I. I wanted to live. I wasn't sure that I was going to, and I didn't care what my breasts looked like. And, and the intensity of that didn't last forever. It, it mellowed out considerably over time. And I ended up being really glad that I had done the re reconstruction and glad that I had done it at the time of the mastectomy. Um, and so that was a real evolution um, for, for me and my feelings. I, in a lot of ways, I feel like I got a body upgrade. I mean, when I met you, I had been pregnant. I had breastfed. I was 45 years old. I, I um, you know, my abdomen was bulging a little bit and my breasts were sagging a little bit and, and surgery, you know, changed all of that. And it was surgery that I would not have gotten under any other circumstances. Um, the hard part about the reconstruction, no, it, the hard part is that, that no matter how great the reconstruction is, my body is a daily reminder that I had stage three breast cancer and that doesn't go away. You know, I have all kinds of thoughts and feelings about that and I don't necessarily want to revisit them every day in the shower, but, <laughs> but there they are, you know, and I think some of that is, is just part of living having had breast cancer it's just part of that whole experience and that also has mellowed considerably over time i think that'll probably continue to mellow um and i consider myself lucky to be here to have that problem you know well we uh i mean we can't uh, it's just unbelievably touching just, just hearing your story, um, you know, as a, as a, uh, you know, a patient, a mother, a wife, um, we're really just so pleased with how well you've done, and we know that, uh, you know, other women hearing this, it's going to help them so much, show them that, you know, they can get through this not only personally but. Um, you know, also their family can get through this as well. Um, so thank you so much for, for taking the time to, thank you. to talk I'm with us. I'm delighted to be able to do it. Thank you. All right, we'll talk soon. Okay. All right, bye have bye. a great day. Say hi to your husband. I will, take care, <laughs> okay, bye bye. bye. Thank you so much for taking the time of to join us. This is um, a celebration of Breast Reconstruction Awareness Day. It's held every year in October, and the date this year is October 21st, and uh, you've been lucky enough to be <laughs> chosen as uh, one of our patients who we'd like for you um, really to share your journey um, so that other women um, you know, can benefit from that. We're gonna ask you some questions, which are gonna be super easy. And, you know, really it's about sharing uh, your experience as a woman going through, um, you know, not only mastectomies with Dr. Kate, but also the, the reconstruction with Dr. Salzberg and myself. Um, for the most important uh, factors that led you to choose implant-based reconstruction. So it's a very personal decision, you know, um, and even though I was not an implant fan, the more research I did, the more I realized that, you know, some women live with these for up to 30 years sometimes. 
and I didn't want to go to a negative place. I wanted to give them a chance. And if things did not work out, I was prepared to go flat and stay flat. But I thought that my gut reaction was to do DTI, direct to implant. And I like to follow my gut instincts. So that's the first thing that came to my mind after having researched all my options and weighed the benefits, the pros and cons. So in terms of genetic testing, uh, we've moved well beyond BRCA1 and 2. Um, and so we can test for lots of different genetic syndromes now, including Lynch, which links uh, colorectal cancer, breast cancer, and endometrial cancer, and other lower um, risk genes like CHECK2 and PAL2. So there's certain panels that can be sent that are just breast cancer panels. You can send a multi-cancer panel, which will tell you about risk of prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer, um, stomach cancer, colon cancer. Um, and it's important to understand your family history and what exactly you have risk for when you meet with a genetic counselor or with a surgeon so that we can send the appropriate uh, panel. Most of our patients will elect for the multi-cancer panel because that gives you the most comprehensive information. And if you're missing family members information, that way we can focus on not missing a cancer syndrome. So uh, you, you knew about the uh, genetic results, obviously, beforehand. What, what would you say to other women um, who either have a BRCA or other mutation um, to help them uh, prepare for surgery? You know, regarding the BRCA, if I may mention something else, I wish that more women were tested for BRCA because I find that sometimes generations skip expression or expression of the BRCA mutation sometimes skips it and or or they might have a very elderly parent like my mom was in her late 60s when she got diagnosed with breast and she refused to get treated or tested and did not they did not offer it to her because no one else in my family had had it and on my other side we had ovarian and so they didn't want to get tested either for some reason and so I waited another year and finally I said you know what I'll get tested <laughs> since somebody else wanted to get tested and but there are some 20 year olds out there that get tested and it's too late for them you know and they have family members who have cancer so I I really want to be an advocate for women to, to kind of maybe educate a little bit about whether there's somebody in your family has cancer or maybe you should get tested for that gene mutation if nobody else wants to it can save your life even though it's not very common we we couldn't agree with you more we uh, we fully advocate women getting tested uh, information and, and that knowledge is, is powerful uh, and allows them to make uh, educated decisions, not only about their health, uh, but also the health of their family members. Uh, so we think it's massively important and, uh, and definitely agree with you. And we're happy you got tested. One, one out of eight women is very disturbing number. And so since then, my mom had uh, went ahead with her ophorectomy and then found out she had stage one ovarian or fallopian and since then had chemo. And then since then, my younger sister also had her ovaries out and is planning a bilateral mastectomy with reconstruction. And my older sister <laughs> will be making, making her journey very soon. So had I not gotten tested myself, who knows, you know? And I, I think about what could have happened if none of us decided to get tested because my mom had it but refused. So how many lives would have been impacted, you know, negatively impacted? And I think it's important for patients to know that just because you get tested and say you have a positive result doesn't mean that surgery has to happen tomorrow. So, you know, many of our younger genetic mutation carriers will get followed for some time and they will make a decision in terms of their family and family planning. Um, and in this day and age, we have PGD, which is how to select out embryos that don't have the genetic mutations. So that's something relatively new that's being offered. And I think it's important for patients to get tested before they have children, because those types of decisions are really important when you're deciding, do you want to proceed with this? Do you want um, to offer your children a life without that gene? Um, and of course, it's very nuanced uh, in terms of decision making, but we want all of our patients to know that we have options. We really can't thank you enough for, for taking the time. We're very proud of you. Um, happy Breast Reconstruction Awareness Day. We're happy you're feeling better. And I know you're off to see your physical therapist. Yes, oh, my highly recommender. 
good. Go work on your exercises and uh, we'll see you in the office soon. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. All right.